The Year of the Black Pony by Walt Morey, Chapter 13. It was one of those typical early winter storms. Wind howled around the corners of the house most of the night. When I awoke in the morning, it had blown itself out, and our white world was utterly still and peaceful. We had about eight inches of snow on the level, but against the barn and house, it had piled up as much as three feet. Frank said the temperature was rising fast and the cattle down among the trees along the creek wouldn't even have to be fed. Ellie was better. At least her cheeks weren't flushed. Her eyes didn't have that glassy stare and she'd gotten some sleep. She came out to breakfast carrying the teddy bear. She didn't eat anything, her throat being so sore and swollen, but she drank some hot milk. Then she returned to bed carrying the bear. I decided it would be a pretty good Christmas Eve after all. I finished breakfast as fast as I could and ran out to see Lucifer. Frank followed behind with the milk pail. Lucifer was standing in his stall, head down, back humped, and his legs spread apart as if he were bracing himself from falling. His mouth was open, and I could hear his labored breathing before I got to the stall. Most of his oats were still in the grain box, and he hadn't touched the hay. I went into the stall and began to pet him and talk to him. He kept his head down and that wheezing, panting sound, as if he were fighting for air, went on. His black coat glistened with sweat. Frank came into the barn and I yelled, Frank, come look at Lucifer. Frank put the milk pail down and walked around the pony, scowling. He ran a hand over his sweating coat and down his front legs. He felt of his ears, looked at his eyes, and listened to his labored breathing. I asked fearfully, what's wrong with him, Frank? He's sick, isn't he? Frank nodded. He's sick, all right. He's mighty sick. I should have come out and checked him during the night, but I didn't dream of anything like this. His legs and ears are cold, and he's having a lot of trouble breathing, and this sweating. What is it, I asked. What's wrong? I saw these symptoms once before a long time ago. I'd say Lucifer's got frosted lungs or pneumonia. Don't know which, or maybe they're the same. What caused it? That ride you made last night in the blizzard. What can we do? I was suddenly frantic with fear. We've got to help him. We've got to. We'll do all we can, Frank said quietly. Just don't get all excited. That won't help. I don't want anything to happen to him. What can we do? First, get some sacks and rub him down good. Get this sweat off him so he won't get any colder. After you've rubbed him down with the sacks, rub him down again with hay, especially his legs. They're cold. The hay is rough. It'll help stimulate his circulation. While you're doing that, I'll do the milking. I worked hard and fast. By the time I'd finished rubbing Lucifer down, Frank was through milking and turned Fawn out. We went to the house together. The minute I got inside, I burst out, Ma, Lucifer's sick. Ma looked at Frank. What's wrong with him? Frank explained and said, Have you got some blankets we can use to put over him to get him warm? All our blankets are on the bed, Ma said. He can have mine. I went to my bed, scooped them up, and walked out. Ma's lips were suddenly tight, but she let me go. We draped the blankets over Lucifer's back and tied them around his body with twine. We both rubbed and rubbed on his legs to start the circulation and get them warm. Then we wrapped them with sacks and tied these with twine. Frank brought in a bucket of fresh water and tried to get him to drink. It was no use. We tried him with fresh hay and oats. He just stood there, head down, not interested in anything. There was an area about 20 feet square between the stalls and where the hay was stored. We spread it deep with straw and put Lucifer in there where we had more room to work around him. He could barely walk those few feet. There he stood, spread-legged, head down, that rasping breathing going on and on. He's going to be all right, isn't he? I asked fearfully. He won't die, Frank. Frank said, Chris, I'm not a veterinarian. I don't know much about horses' sicknesses. Like most ranchers, I know how to work them, and I've got a few home remedies when they do get sick. I hope he's going to be all right. We're going to do everything we possibly can for him, but I can't promise you any more. Isn't there a horse doctor or veterinarian we can get someplace? Frank shook his head, not within a hundred miles that I know of. What do other ranchers do when their horses get sick? The same thing we're doing. Then nature either gets them well or they die.
Frosted lung isn't necessarily fatal, and Lucifer has several things going for him. He's young, and he's always been strong and healthy. We stayed with Lucifer all forenoon. He moved around a little. Mostly he stood in one place, head down, legs braced and panting. He wouldn't eat or drink. He seemed very weak and unsteady. About noon, he lay down. He couldn't get up again. We left him there and went into lunch, but I couldn't eat. I finally went back out to him. He hadn't moved. He lay on his side, his sack-wrapped legs stretched out like sticks, his head lying flat on the straw. I felt under the blanket. His body was warm. His legs were warm. I tried to tempt him with hay, then a handful of oats. He paid no attention. I sat down at his head and began to stroke him. You've got to eat, I said. You've got to eat or you'll die. Please eat, Lucifer. Don't die. Please don't die. I started to cry. I sat there petting him and crying. I don't know when Frank and Ma came in, but there they were. I turned my head away and wiped my eyes so they wouldn't see the tears. Christopher, Ma said, don't take it so hard. It's not as if he was a really valuable horse. That did it. I was on my feet facing her, and all my frustrations, fears, and disappointments came pouring out. I wasn't only mad at what she'd said, but the way she'd continued to act the past months. It flooded out like a dam breaking. I was half crying, half shouting at her. You would say that. You've hated him from the day he came. You weren't even willing to give him a chance, and you wouldn't have given him any credit no matter what he did. To you, he was bad from the very beginning. He could never do anything right. You never tried to understand or make allowances. Well, he saved my life last night. And maybe he did Ellie some good bringing that silly bear home for her. That don't mean a thing to you, but it does to me. I'm going to try to save him if it's the last thing I ever do, whether you like it or not. Ma looked at me like she couldn't believe what she'd heard. That was a very stupid thing for me to say, she said softly. I didn't mean it the way it sounded. I'm sorry. You're never sorry for anything you say, I raged. You always mean what you say. You make up your mind and you never change it. Never, no matter what. You've never given an inch in your whole life. You never will. I was out of breath and run down. I turned my back on mine, sat down again at Lucifer's head. I was shaking inside and blinded by tears. For a moment, it was deathly still in the barn. Then Frank said quietly, We've got to turn him over, Chris. If he lies in this position too long, he'll get twisted gut, and that'll be the end of him. Take hold of his front legs. I'll take the back. We rolled Lucifer over easily, and he just sort of sighed. We covered him up again. Ma watched, arms folded. She didn't say a word until we had him covered. Then she said, Christopher, I'd like to help. Her voice sounded very small and kind of plaintive, like Ellie's when her throat was sore and she went to Ma for help. Frank said, Mabel, we'll take any kind of help and glad to get it. What do you suggest? That breathing sounds like pneumonia, Ma said. Why don't you doctor him like you would a human? I've never doctored a human with pneumonia. I have. Christopher, go fill some kettles and pails with water. Put them on the stove and build up a roaring fire. I want lots of hot water. Then bring the tub out here. What are you going to do, Frank asked. I'm going to put a mustard plaster on his chest, for one thing. I left the barn without a word. While I filled kettles with water, put them on the stove, and built a roaring fire, Ma was mixing a bowl of yellow mustard and water. We were ready in a, about the same time. I carried the tub and half a dozen newspapers. Ma had the bowl of mustard and a blanket she'd taken from Frank's bed. We sat down in the straw beside Lucifer, shoved back the blanket, and began to spread the mustard over his chest back and sides with a knife. Here's where the trouble is, Ma explained. This area needs lots of heat, and this will make it. When she finished, she put the newspapers over the mustard and the blanket over that. We'll leave this on for a few hours. She rose and stood looking down at Lucifer. He's awfully weak. He's got to eat. She frowned, nibbling thoughtfully at a finger. I'm going to try something. I give Ellie milk with an egg in it when her sore throat's so bad she can't swallow solid food. She turned and left the barn. I began to feel better. Ma had taken over and she went about bustling with purpose. She had doctored Ellie and me through all sorts of sicknesses. 
she'd do the same for Lucifer. She was back in minutes with a gallon of milk into which she had beaten a half dozen eggs. Frank held up Lucifer's head. Ma held the milk under his nose and began to talk to him, just as, just as she did with Ellie and me when we were sick. Come on, Lucifer, she coaxed. This is good. Just taste it. Doesn't it smell good? Taste it, Lucifer. Just taste it. She dipped a palmful and smeared it on his mouth. He pulled his head away. Ma stood up after a minute and Frank let Lucifer's head down. He won't drink milk, at least not now, so we'll have to wait. She felt under the blanket. The mustard's making him warm. That's good. Frank and Ma sat down in the hay to wait and watch. Ma sent me to the house to check on the stove and Ellie. Ellie was sitting in a chair rocking the teddy bear. I thought she looked some better. She asked, is Lucifer all right? No, I said. Is he going to die, Chris? I don't know, I mumbled. I filled the stove and brought in two big armloads of wood. The water in the pails and pans covering the stovetop was barely warm. Ellie went back to bed. When I returned to the barn, I noticed water dripping steadily from the eaves. It was thawing. Ma said, we heard it dripping a few minutes ago. Lucifer lay as he had. Will the weather getting warmer help? I asked. I always like to think so, Ma said. Certainly he shouldn't chill so easily. You might open the door and let in more fresh air. Fresh air is important. I opened the door part way, then sat down at Lucifer's head and gently stroked his face and listened to the steady drip of melting snow. We turned Lucifer again. He sort of groaned and sighed, but made no effort to rise. Ma felt around under the blanket, then ran her hand down his legs. He seems warm. She tried him again with the bucket of milk. It was no use. Christopher, she said, go to the root cellar and get a half dozen of big juicy carrots. We've got to tempt him somehow. I ran for the carrots. Lucifer refused them. Ma pried his jaws apart and put a carrot in his mouth. He spit it out. Well, she murmured, that didn't work. We waited again. Ma went to the house to check on Ellie, but soon returned. Frank cleaned Jess and Jip's stables, put fresh hay in the mangers, and came back. I went to the house twice and stoked the stove. The last time I filled the wood box again. The kettles of water were steaming. Ellie was asleep, the teddy bear tight in her arms. When I returned to the barn, first dusk was creeping across the snow. The thawing drips had now become small streams running off the roof. I took off my Mackinac. It would soon be Christmas Eve. There was no change in Lucifer. Ma asked, how long has the mustard plaster been on? Frank looked at his watch, almost five hours. Let's take it off and try the hot packs. They always seem to help Ellie, maybe more than anything else. We'll have to wash off the mustard. Christopher, fill the tub about half full of hot water, then refill the buckets and put them on the stove again. It didn't take long to wash off the mustard. Then Ma soaked the blanket she'd taken from Frank's bed and wrung it out. They draped it around and under Lucifer's chest, then packed dry gunny sacks against it to hold it in place. That's making more heat than the mustard plaster, Ma said. After supper, we'll change it again. Supper was a quick pickup meal that we ate hurriedly. Ellie ate a little for the first time, then went back to bed. I didn't eat much. I hadn't the heart for it. I was about to leave for the barn again when Ma went to the Christmas tree and got the package with the twenty two rifle in it and laid it in my lap. Merry Christmas, Miss Christopher, she said. I sat there and held it. I didn't even feel like unwrapping it. Here I had the gun I'd wanted for months, and it didn't mean a thing to me. All I could think of was Lucifer lying out in the barn and probably dying. I managed to mumble, thanks, thanks a lot. Then I laid the gun down on the table and went out. It was the worst Christmas Eve I'd ever known. As soon as Ma and Frank came to the barn, they changed the blanket on Lucifer again. After that, they changed it about every half hour or so when the blanket got cool. It kept me humping to keep them in hot water. The stars came out in a cloudless sky and Christmas Ridge rose sheer and white in the moonlight. Water ran steadily from the eaves. Frank lit a lantern and hung it from a nail. I milked fawn, strained the milk, and put it in the pans for the cream to rise. 
Then it was time to change the blanket on Lucifer again, and I ran for hot water, changing the blanket, turning him, trying to coax him to eat, to drink. This went on for hours. It must have been somewhere near midnight when Lucifer stirred, lifted his head briefly, and dropped it again. Ma bent over him. She ran her hands under the blanket, moving them over his chest and legs. He feels plenty warm, she said. She looked closely at his eyes. They seem a little clearer. I wonder. She left the words hanging there. Could be some kind of reflex action, Frank said. Maybe. Ma's voice had a note of excitement. Christopher, get at his head and take hold of the halter. Frank? It was the first time in all the months we'd been there that she didn't say Mr. Chase when we were alone. Take his tail. We're going to try and get him up. We've simply got to get him on his feet or he's never going to make it. I pulled and Frank lifted and we all talked and coaxed him. Lucifer groaned and partially sat up, then collapsed back on his side. Ma tried the milk again. It was no use. She tried the carrot. His nostrils fluttered, his lips moved, but he didn't take it. It's no use, Mabel, Frank said gently. We tried. We've done everything we can think of, and he's worse than we found him this morning. He's too weak to stand, even if we could get him up. He knows it, too. You mean he's going to die? I asked. Not die, Frank said. There's no sense letting him suffer. When there's no hope, you put an animal out of its misery. Shoot him. No, no, you can't do that. You can't. I looked at Ma as I always did when I was in trouble. She was looking down at Lucifer thoughtfully, nibbling the end of her finger. Then I saw her chin come up and her back straighten. I knew she'd made up her mind about something. She had that indomitable, stubborn look about her that I had seen the morning we'd walked into Frank Chase's cabin and she announced that we'd come to stay. It was something wonderful and strong and unbeatable. My sagging spirits were immediately uplifted. I'm not licked, she said in that positive voice. I will not quit. She looked at Frank. Do you have any whiskey? Whiskey? You mean for a stimulant, something to give him a boost? Exactly. Frank shook his head. There's no whiskey around here, it never has been, and I don't know how you'd get it tonight of all nights. Ma was still nibbling at her finger. Harry brought home a bottle a couple of times. He didn't know I found out. He used to keep it in the grain bin in the barn. I wonder if there could be one there now. I said, I'll ride over on Nellie and see. You're not afraid at night? Nothing to be afraid of, I said. It's thawing and it's moonlight. It was a beautiful night. The moonlight on the snow made it almost as bright as day. Just the kind of night Christmas Eve should be. Our old place was dark and quiet. I left the barn door open and the moonlight flooded in and lit the interior. I went straight to the grain bin, threw up the lid, and felt around inside. There was a bottle. I lifted it out and held it to the light. It was empty. In the hope that Pa had stashed another somewhere, I hunted around on the beams and ledges. There was nothing.